ki runga i tēnei huihuinga, ki a tapatahi tamu, tō mātou ngākau, ki a tūtuku, ta whai ai, e rongo, ki a maua, whaka maua ki a tīna haumi e hui e tāi. Thank you. Now, um, just before we start, is there any conflict of interest <coughs> regarding this particular agenda here? Um, and thank you, Debbie, for putting out your one yesterday. We wouldn't have known that otherwise. Um, has anyone got any specific one to any of these submissions? Probably just the first person oh, up. Oh, the first person up. Api has slight conflict coming from the first person up. Um, so the second thing, um, this is a continuation of yesterday's meeting, um, I presume. Uh, so we don't have to do anything formal around that. I just want to make one comment, though. Um, people are pretty um, upset that we're only giving them five minutes, so we need to manage that. Um, even if they got 10 minutes, if councillors could um, just keep their questions really short so that we're not taking There was a couple of occasions yesterday, including myself, maybe three occasions, where we took up to 20% <coughs> of the submitter's time in our question. I'm going to repeat this in a minute. Well, yeah, well it really needs to be repeated in a <laughs> on, two, on two accounts. <laughs> I must say, Mr Chairman, I think it's working quite well and I think if um, submitters focus themselves and, and you focus them as Chairman, <coughs> five minutes for most people is quite adequate. Yeah, no, I think that's actually right. I think five minutes is adequate. It's just that um, some people don't. And, uh, and sometimes, um, um, you know, they've thought about this for a long time and they're passionate about it and they think that we, we are only given the five minutes and it kind of hurts them a bit but actually if they think about it five minutes to get your point out mm. is probably adequate but people don't think that Fenton the, the only other thing I'd add is a couple of submitters have said you know it's your only chance to come and talk to us but actually that's not quite right yeah. they can come to council meetings with you know seek leave to come and present uh, for, for three or five minutes whatever the standing order says um, and we don't actually you know, well, we used to put it out there, I guess, but we haven't done for a while. Maybe we should um, talk about that too. Yeah, no, that's correct. There's also that's nothing to stop individuals approaching councillors to discuss the issues that are really concerning them as well. Mm. Yeah, it's quite interesting. My sister, who was an Auckland City Councillor, said almost every meeting yeah. they would set aside time for somebody or more than one person, perhaps, to come and do 10-minute presentations as part of their meeting. It was standard practice. <coughs> Played a well too, so. Is that actually that's not a bad idea, Dan? Ten minutes. I think that's a very good idea. We provide for the time in our rule. We just don't. We don't. We don't do it. Don't particularly it. promote it or we don't promote broadcast. It. Well, if we did promote it, though, people would would use that ten minutes. I imagine it would get used twelve times a year. It's a, it's not unknown. Has, has any effort been made to tighten up the last two submitters? Yes, yeah. they've been contacted, and we're trying to get them to come earlier. Uh, yeah, that's the other thing today. Um, we've had quite a few people pull out. Um, we don't know why. Maybe they watched it yesterday and wasn't weren't that impressed. Um, but people have pulled out. So, yeah, we're going to try and tighten those up. Are there any submitters tomorrow? No. no. None so, tomorrow. No. So we started with 89 people wanting to be heard, and it's just naturally people have just ticked the box to give themselves the option, and then when they've been contacted, almost half have said no longer want to this year. So it's been a bit shambolic to manage. It's the nature of the game. Very well considering. <laughs> Are there any other comments? We've got a minute before we are, we are calling Uppy to the stage. Is Uppy in the meeting today? He's in the That's meeting, he's helping us in the meeting and he's the submitter as well. He's standing up for Mike. Mike's gone to Australia today. And I did have another trustee coming to submit, but was waiting on the date for confirmation. Didn't arrive, so I'll, I'll be Welcome to today. our meeting, Councillor Barker. <coughs> I'm happy to run two, three meetings at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> have you got this thing organised yet? <laughs> <laughs> I've also got a hunting trip for you organised, but you were so busy on the phone, I didn't get to be able to talk oh, to no, you about I've it. Got, Maybe I've got to cancel I've, it. I've got transport organised now, too. <laughs> I've got a special oh, hunting trip organised. <laughs> Okay, um, we'll call you to the. Yeah, yeah, you, you should go up here, I think. Oh. <laughs> Unusual. 
Now, what's Hoppy, happening, Chair? Hoppy, you have, um, you appear to have 10 minutes. How did you get that? <laughs> I put my good teeth in this morning, <laughs> Mr Chair. OK. Well, I... Um, o ku ranga tira, uh, ngā wahini toa, ngā mihini nui ki a koutou katoa. On behalf of Teranga Marae, at the head of the Wairo River, where there's the confluence of the Rua Kitiri, the Hangaroa and the Wairo, the Kaitara High and three others, um, we send our greetings to the Council and its members and would like to start our submission off by saying we support the long-term plan and the intentions of this Council to draw a line in the sand and make some serious efforts in the restoration of our environment. And we're looking forward to working collaboratively with Hawke's Bay Regional Council as a Tangata Whenua representative group at the head of the Wairo River, who currently holds the mandate, I guess, to bring back the uh, Kōwhai Ngutukaka Ma, which is one of our endangered species on the list. And we recognise that a strong collaborative relationship with Hawke's Bay Regional Council and other LTAs is the best way to initiate that project and to get some sustainable activity happening in that space. It aligns naturally with our other intentions around pest control and biodiversity. So essentially we're looking forward to working, uh, that's the main reason why we wanted to have a verbal opportunity to submit today, was to express our desire to work collaboratively with the Hawke's Bay Regional Council and to support the long-term plan as it was promoted and uh, sent around the region and catchments. Um, with a particular focus on looking at how the Council will develop its tangata whenua relationships and for Wairo specifically as um, within the next two to three years the focus will start to shift to that region. We want to work actively with the Council around building capacity and capability not only with um, the residents of the catchment but also in the way that we work proactively and genuinely with staff of the Hawke's Bay Regional Council to develop the plans and implement new initiatives across our catchment area. So we're quite excited around that opportunity as Tangata Whenua and um, we're approaching the relationship um, over the next few years as something we can build on. Uh, that's pretty much all we want to add to our submission which has been put forward which identifies um, some areas around uh, staff and asset allocation over the next two years, specifically around the uh, Ngutu Kākama and how we might be able to accelerate the restoration of that endangered species. Um, and we look forward to ongoing conversations with James, the Chair and the Council around how we can participate in identifying what are some good ways and productive ways for us to encourage the utilisation of the resources at the Council's disposal. Thank you for your time. I think that clearly expresses everything Taranga would like to put across the table. And we wish you the best for the rest of your submissions today. Especially that guy sitting in the corner. I know he'll work really hard. So, no reira, ka nui te mihia ki a koutou katoa. Ka pai tōra. Kia ora. Thank you, Api. Um, councillors will have some questions. I, I have one straight up, though. Um, so I've had a lot of, uh, as the chair, I've had a lot of uh, meetings with various parties in Waro. Um, you know, the ladies who want to fix the river and the Tai Whenua and there's a whole lot of huge groundswell of enthusiasm which we need to make into activities, especially around some of the marais and there's some people out on various rivers and I'm just wondering um, how we can coordinate this around um, Tao 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 and um, can, is there a way you can help we can coordinate this because there's a couple of nursery projects um, and if we, if we want to put some serious money in there, which we, we're really keen to do, we want to make sure that it is coordinated properly and we're talking to the right people. Any thoughts on that? Yep. So the first one would be that you're absolutely right, there is a growing groundswell, not just within Wairo, but nationally actually. Um, but Wairo residents, particularly those of Māori descent who have a history of being dependent upon the waterways and the land for um, not only income recently, but also for customary practice. Um, we meet regularly, we meet often, we see the damages um, that decades of sustained practice have caused to the whenua. So um, that groundswell is looking to grow. Uh, and you're right, a level of coordination is required. Uh, from my perspective and personally, that's best driven from, um, from a Māori perspective, that's best driven from the marae. 
uh, that's still the central hub, like a school or a community hall. Um, they tend to be the places where we gather, we meet, we coordinate, and then we move into action. So my recommendation to the council is to build strong relationships with our marais. Um, as with regards to Tato Tato, uh, they have a very specific mandate over the next six months, which um, doesn't allow for a heck of a lot of room in the next six months to put any great detail into the coordination of planning. Um, but it is a part of the strategic economic revitalisation strategy that they are, are developing, and it's a natural fit for where we want to go, and the Council is a part of a, a tripartite agreement, it's already uh, a key partner in that. So I do see Tato Tato as a key player, naturally being the PSG in that space, um, but with the current demands on their, I guess the outcomes required for the trustees, um, they s the tasks ahead of us are very specific, um, and it's about forming those relationships with our partners rather than initiating anything of substance in the next six months, but rather building those terms of reference. That's, that's, we're limited by our deed with regards to where we can move in that space. Um, does that answer your question? Just to absolutely clarify though, so as a regional leader from Wairua, I know you're in Napier, but Wairua as well, you would be really happy if we had direct relationships with the, the Marae committees on these some of these issues, on a lot of these issues? Um, it is my opinion from experience, I'm currently Chair of Taranga Marae, so it is my experience that if you want to mobilise that groundswell, while um, Māori make up 60% of the population within the district, um, there's 40% that are not Māori, uh, but they're married to half of us, so you know, we can get them there. Um, <laughs> they are. <laughs> so um, everything within Te Wairo is still highly centred around our cultural practices, um, which includes um, all the activities that run from our marais. So I would recommend that you're, if you were looking to work with Tangata Whenua in and along our waterways, that you would put a concerted focus in a strategy that incorporates marae in that strategy. I got it. Okay. Um, Paul and then Tom. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, RP. There's part of, part of the uh, funding proposal in our long-term plan is just increasing funding to, uh, to improve Tangata Whenua relationships. Um, some of that obviously is going towards recompensing um, members for attendance at meetings and so on. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, um, have you got any views on how we should be looking at improving Tangata Whenua relationships internally in, in, the, in the council? Within the council itself? Yeah, within the council itself. Have you got any views on how that should be, we should be managing that or doing that? Um, in the interest of time, I'll be open and I'll be honest and straight up. So I think the best, the best approach for any institute, any organisation that wants to engage with Māori culture or Māori in general, um, the best approach is an open mind and a willingness to learn. Um, and that's from both parties, not just um, the tangata whenua. It's about recognising the diversity that each of us offers and how that diversity can be used to create a synergy. So... Um, if the question is how can we better engage with Māori, I would start with an open and willing mind to learn. Um, we come with a lot of preloaded judgments, uh, preconceptions and misconceptions about how each other live and roll in the world. Um, and until you get a chance to sit down and talk with the person eye to eye, you don't often get a chance to challenge those preconceptions. So, um, and that's the hard part, not just for the council, but also for Māori. We have a different history to the council, so we come preloaded as well. Um, it would be a good starting point and a good foundation to accept that an open mind and a willingness to learn will provide enlightenment. May not provide an answer, but it will provide enlightenment and understanding. Thank you, Tom. I pass. Ah. Alan. Oh, Alan, sorry. Last question. Um, yeah, RP, uh, excuse my ignorance, but you referred to an endangered species. What, what was that? Um, we have been given the, uh, it's a kaka beak. It's oh, the yeah. white strain. It's the uh, Ngutu kaka ma. It was, went extinct, so far as we know, roughly around the 1950s. 
that's, that's a plant. That is a plant. Yeah. Yep. It's um, um it's a sweet smelling uh, white flower. Uh, it's the and the genetics which were done on the plant found that it came from Fakapunaki and grew along the Ruakuturi and the Hangaroa, which is consistent with some of the names in that space and some of the histories we share. Uh, we were given the opportunity to lead the resurgence and re um, proliferation of this particular species, but we had no capacity uh, and no capability. We were just given this wonderful mandate and this wonderful plant, and uh, with the instructions, here it is, now make it thrive. So we've, we've sung lots of songs, and we've done lots of karakia, and we've planted well over 300 around the region, um, but what we recognised very quickly is that we needed to invest our energies into building good, strong, strategic partnerships and to rely on the expertise that's available within those partnerships. Thank you, Api. Good luck with that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That was... Um, really gave us some good insight onto what we need to do in, in Wairau um, because it is um, it's a huge opportunity for us to embrace and uh, to embrace the enthusiasm which is which is there at a groundswell so thank you very much um, now you're back to your role here get, get back here because we have Shane coming on and um, wanna you're on Shane thanks mate you wanna welcome him got a coat up <laughs> Now you can ask the questions. Ah. Welcome, Shane. Kia ora, Shane. Uh, ngā mihi nui nui, kia ora Tēnā koe, Shane. Nā māhara mai ki roto i tēnei huihuinga, i tēnei rā. Uh, tēnei te mihi atu ki tēnā. Uh, e hoa, uh, ngā mihi. Kia ora. Okay, thank you uh, for presenting your submission, Shane. So, um, you have 10 minutes, and we've had to, um, you know, I know time is short and um, it's the way of it at the moment. Um, I'm sorry, but um, so you can use it the way you wish, you know, if you want to use the whole 10 minutes or you want to leave time for questions as Afi did, that's up to you. And we've got a little bit of leeway there. So, the floor is yours, mate. Kia ora, Rex. Uh, I'll just take about three, I think, so that we can leave a bit for questions. I picked <laughs> up on a couple of quick key questions there. Um, so I've made some assumptions that... Um, you probably all haven't read all of our submission because you've probably received lots of them. So just to paraphrase... Uh, uh, we through, have read it. Have you? Yeah. Do you want to test us? Shall I? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll just paraphrase it, eh? Um, so if you don't know Maunga Haruru Tangi 2, um, we're the treaty settlement from, well, from the Napier Airport at Altu Pornui Stream, which is north of the Waikari River. We have nearly 7,000 registered members. Our first point is about working with Tangata Whenua um, versus enabling Tangata Whenua engagement with the Council, so picking up on a question there uh, internally and externally is probably where our focus is, and obviously we've made part of our submission that we think um, there should be some funding apportioned and uh, committed to ensuring that you can assist hapu and iwi to get environmental management plans. Um, they're they're going to benefit all of us, in particular the Council. Um, and also through not just um, sitting fees and committees or governance, but actually enabling tangata whenua engagement on the various kaupapa that the council is leading out on, such as we've alluded back there around the riparian reforestation, biodiversity, biosecurity and coast and marine. Um, I won't touch on the appointment of the two muaki because one, we support it. Um, two, we've got, we've got a point around um, internal capability to support that two muaki role. Um, and just want to acknowledge um, your leadership around around looking to appoint that role as well. So thank you. Um, civil defence, we picked up on on one of the key consultation points there, and um, want to really, um, I guess, partnership with with the council around and the other councils around preparing marae for being able to respond to emergencies rather than um, ad hocly looking to marae to pick up um, or manage a response when it comes. Um, so we really want to have that conversation early and be proactive around that prior to. Um, Hawke's Bay Tourism, so we, we support uh, the submission from the council and the main reason being is that we've been concerned for a couple of years now actually. There's uh, a couple of clauses in the contract, I think it might be four or eight, where um, there's supposed to be a focus around developing Māori tourism activities and that hasn't necessarily been occurring that well. Um, so, and we think obviously we're part of Te Kahi Ohanga and um, 
Matariki Reds Hawks Bay and think that there's an opportunity to divert some of that funding from the public purse or the rates into um, focused Māori tourism activities across Hawke's Bay as opposed to um, some of the activities that Hawke's Bay tourism has been focusing on. Um, the last point that I'll just make um, is around funding our future and we acknowledge that the council has a lot of infrastructure and a lot of assets that need maintaining over the next 30 years. The point we want to raise really is um, and picking up on your focus of late to concentrate on your core business, that being the environment, uh, around the outfall discharges across the bay, uh, not just Pampac, obviously, um, we're in court with them, but also the um, civic discharges. And our question is really, did, are those necessary? And if they're not, then how can we work over the next sort of 30 years with you to try and get those removed over time um, so we can start to enhance our marine environment rather than degradate it? So we're, we're wanting you to when you're thinking about funding our future over the next 30 years, not just think about your own assets, but, but the broader focus around <coughs> environmental uh, opportunities to enhance, and um, some of those can have economic offsets as well. So, kia ora, that'll do for me. Thank you, Shane. Um, question, Debbie. Thank you, Shane, good morning. Um, Maori tourism has come up throughout this long-term <coughs> plan, and I'm interested in your thoughts, because I think it was the last long-term plan um, we we as councillors were, became aware there was a problem, so we um, stipulated that Hawke's Bay Tourism put a, um, a Maori representative on their board. Mm. So have we made a mistake in doing that? And I'm not discussing personalities, but I mean, where have we gone wrong? Because it seems that the problem is exacerbated, not corrected itself. Um, so maybe touching on the first point uh, around the supposed Māori representative on the Tourism Board uh, is probably maybe considered more of a representative of the Council, not necessarily Māori, um, given that that representative is closely associated to the Council and I think was appointed by the Council. No. no. Independent. They had an appointed committee. Right. OK. He got um, through. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I know, and I think, I guess, Debbie, we look at outcomes at the end of the day and we haven't seen them. My, my main concern was when I spoke with the CEO before that occurred uh, that the CEO was not aware of, of the requirement to assist in the development of Māori tourism activities uh, until we accessed the contract and could see that it was pretty clear and obviously so it hadn't been focused, uh, hadn't been measured and monitored so our concern again just comes back to outcomes. We think actually nationally it's pretty obvious that Māori tourism is one of if not the single most uh, greatest opportunity to grow our um, GDP. Paul. Um, thank you Chair and further to, on the tourism line uh, Shane, um, you've mentioned the uh, and it's something of a split of, of funding from um, going from sort of going direct to um, um, Tourism Hawks Bay for some to be split off to Māori tourism. Mm. Have you got any number, you know, any sort of split in mind in terms of percentage if we were going to do that? He's pushing the buttons. Yeah. Me. Um, you don't need to, you, it's sound. Right, thank you. Uh, I guess, um, Paul, we, we always look at a partnership being 50-50. Um, whether that model represents opportunity for Māori to engage inside of it um, appropriately. Again, that's what we're questioning. So I think there's a fair question that 50% of that could be focused around developing Māori tourism specifically. Again, um, picking up on a national view, which is that tourism, Māori tourism experiences could be the one single most greatest opportunity in the country to lift our economics. Thank you. Alan? Um, thanks, Shane. Um, look, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, and I'm sidetracking a little bit, but you, uh, I understand that you were involved quite closely with Matariki. Yep. Yep. Can you give us a bit of a... Because, you know, we're contributors, funders, and we're carrying out some of the objectives. Can you give us a brief idea of how you think it's going? Because it's my observation that it's, it's almost uh, disappeared from observation certainly from, from my perspective. Mm. Um, good question. I, I think it's going, could have gone better, like most things, but uh, some of these things take take a while, and I think where we've landed in recent weeks is very positive. So there's a couple of key things I think the Council can celebrate. One, that this is the only integrated Māori um, 
and council and private sector strategy across the country. Uh, and also we've just landed on a governance model to reflect that, so I think that's positive. Um, certainly from our perspective, we're getting on with quite a few outcomes. So uh, between three of our Māori entities, we've pushed through about 150 young people through driver's licences, placed nearly 250 into full-time employment, and also working up a couple of Māori tourism, um, Hawke's Bay Māori tourism is an outcome of Matariki Red, so that's been established, that's running. So I think there's been some um, easy wins, if we can take it that way. Alan, but um, some of the big meaty things are working through at the moment and I guess that's where our preference has always been to try and be part of and lead a strategy that's collaborative <coughs> rather than trying to do our own. Uh, and we're happy to do that but we'd rather not because we think that um, you know the collective strength is, is how Hawke's Bay is going to succeed broadly and obviously from a Māori perspective we are looking right from Mahia down to Wairarapa ourselves. So. We, we want to really have that focus of from a kahungunu collective hapu and various iwi such as Hinuru and Ruapani um, to, to make sure that we're all involved. So we've, we've opted to sort of stay in that space for the time being so that we can try and get a, a regional collaborative approach as, a, as opposed to, uh, you know, te kei or takitumu or the collective settlements taking our own. Yeah, well, there's no question the collaborative approach is the essential way to go. And, and that's a break with the past where lots of individual entities tried to do their own things and mm. fell, fell over one another. But can I suggest that maybe there's a need for something like a, I don't know, a newsletter or um, an easily accessible website just to keep the likes of ourselves informed as to what's going on? Yeah, I mean, um, that's a good suggestion. I think there's, there's no comms team at the moment, there's a website, but... I think um, I think you'll see communication starting to come soon. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, <coughs> thanks, Rex. Um, hi, Shane. Um, you've proposed in your submission to us that the council considers um, funding all of the treaty claimant groups uh, to develop environmental management plans. Can you just elaborate a little bit on? what you would see as being the status of those plans and how they might integrate with the whole range of other plans that we're required to do under the Resource Management Act, like the Regional Resource Management Plan and the individual catchment plans and so forth. How would all that integrate together in, in your mind? Yeah, so um, thank you. Uh, I think firstly, so, so you've funded in the past um, Te Tai Whenua Hiratonga to develop their plan, which is sort of the basis of, of our submission in terms of funding being dedicated or committed. Uh, how would they integrate? So legally, um, through the RMA, we've transitioned from a hapu or iwi environmental management plan to a te mana whakahono plan. Um, so it sits quite clearly inside of the RMA. Um, so that would be the status of it. Um, it would need to be recognised by all of the authorities and also all of the hapu and the iwi and, uh, I guess, resource consent applicants. And how it integrates, um, fortunately and unfortunately for the likes of, of ourselves as treaty settlements, uh, it would have to integrate across all of those plans, Peter, because there's no part in, I guess, in our te ao Māori that we can leave out. So it's need to, it's going to need to make sure it's linked to everything. And I guess when we look at our recommendation of sixty thousand dollars, we know these things are costing up to one hundred and eighty to two hundred thousand dollars to get done. Yeah, it doesn't sound like enough. <coughs> thank you guys, um, thank you Shane, that was excellent, really appreciate that and your frankness, um, that was really good. Okay, we'll move to thank you. keep your cup of tea and you can let, you know, have to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to join us for the rest of the day if you like. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> he really wants to himself. <laughs> Liz, we can have you now, thank you. And welcome. Kia ora tato and Lorena, um, thank you for your time. I have a um, presentation for you. I've got have pictures. You sent it through? I oh, have. You've got pictures. I have. I've got pictures. And Liz, you, um, <coughs> while you're setting us up, we have ten minutes. Yes, absolutely. And um, we have a little bit of latitude as we have no, with I, Shane, but only a fraction. No, I've done lots of these, and I'm I'm going to done keep myself to time. Oh, good on you. Keep myself to time. <laughs> um, first off, can I? Um, um, Put in apologies for Mike Wild, uh, sorry, Mike um, Henley, who is our 
um, Chair for Hawke's Bay Wine Growers, and also Zan Harding, um, who's our Deputy Chair. Zan is our expert in all things land management. He's involved very, very closely in the um, tank process, and he is overseas at the moment, so unfortunately he can't be here. Mike um, Henley is doing his bit for uh, wine tourism, and he's talking to a, an international wine writer who's visiting the region, and he's hopefully going to leave the region and bring a whole lot of people back with him the next time he comes. Uh, so you're stuck with me, um, unfortunately. Um, I just thought it was useful just to recap because quite often um, what we find when we talk about the wine industry in Hawke's Bay is that a lot of what we do is not actually that well known. Uh, the fact that um, we have um, nearly 5,000 or 4,500 hectares of vineyards um, and that 98% of that vineyard area is actually sustainable wine growing certified which is a, uh, a system that New Zealand <coughs> wine growers has put in place that has international recognition. Um, we are the second, grow second largest wine region in New Zealand um, and yet we're only 12.6% of the total grape growing area in New Zealand. So the rest of it, or the majority of it, as you can imagine, is in Marlborough. Um, but we are the second biggest. Um, we have 100 vineyards, 79 wineries, 35 cellar doors, 19 winery restaurants, and eight winery accommodation um, venues. So we have a lot more to do with the things that you are very focused on um, in, your, in your LTP than probably meets the eye. Um, we are in the process of uh, developing a 10-year strategy of our own and you guys are getting, uh, guys and gals are getting a sneak preview of where we're positioning ourselves before some of our members are actually getting it. And the reason I'm doing that is because I think it reflects very much our interest in your LTP, in the, in the Regional Council's LTP, in so far that everything that goes to the experience of wine in Hawke's Bay is a reflection of not only our people and our wine, but also our landscape. And over the summer, we did extensive research with cellar door visitors, and uh, international and domestic cellar door visitors told us quite clearly that they don't visit Hawke's Bay just for the wine, um, they visit and, and don't visit our cellar doors just for the wine. They visit because of the entire experience they get, which takes in everything about our natural environment, as well as the people who front their experience when they're here and the people they interact with, and also the quality of that experience in terms of everything from restaurants through to um, activities that they might do through to um, engaging in, in our flora and fauna the way they want to and so forth. So we're really proud that the way we're going to be positioning ourselves going forward is all around encapsulating all of those things, which again is why we think um, we're why we have a real interest in the LTP and we have a real interest um, in the focus that you've given to um, improving and restoring the environment. Um, quite simply, our preferences are that, <clears throat> as I say, we're very pleased that you are um, stepping up funding for biodiversity and for um, the environment. Um, but we would also like to see, this is an and, we would like to see the tourism funding remain as well. Um, and the reasons for this, I'm just going to quickly summarise. I did have other slides, but I think I can just summarise it by sticking on this. Um, where the, um, the environmental, the, the increased spending in environmental outcomes is concerned, we absolutely support that. Um, wine is all about tewa. And what's interesting about Hawke's Bay is that the wine that is produced in Gimlet Gravels is distinctively different to the wine that's produced just, just down the road in Bridge Pa or at Te Oanga or in the Havelock Hills. And that's actually the story that we tell to people when we come here. It is the diversity of our soil, it's the diversity of our climate, and it's the diversity of the growing conditions that we have that is at the heart of our story. So our members are incredibly focused on making sure that we have a landscape and an environment that supports our region long into the future. And we agree that it's time that the, that the investment was stepped up. Um, our members are concerned, though, that 
in terms of the long-term plan, they're concerned to, um, because they are businesses, they want certainty. So they need to have certainty of what that investment program will look like and how it will play out for all of the primary sectors, but particularly, obviously, for them. Um, they do have some concerns about um, equity and balance in the proposals around how that funding would be spent, and so they're really keen to make sure that um, there isn't a, an over-indexing towards the pastoral sector, perhaps, and that everyone is taken into account, all land users are taken into account. The other really important um, element in this piece is that um, we are very, very focused in the tank process, and we understand the concept of catchment and of, of systems, and we believe that there is huge opportunity for um, the Regional Council to uh, reinforce the importance of systems and the interconnection and the, in and the integrity of entire systems in the way you allocate the funding. So we wouldn't necessarily want to see the funding going to landowners specifically, but we would like to see a catchment investment approach if that's possible, for the very reason that it reinforces to all landowners, yes, you are an individual business in yourself, but you are part of a bigger ecosystem. And so the impacts that from your business are actually the impacts for everyone. Um, where tourism is concerned, um, as I said, we don't see it as an either or for the environment or tourism, we see it as an and. And we would really like um, to stress that um, there's been a lot of debate around tourism. You've got the tourism, um, Hawke's Bay Tourism speaking this morning. I'm not going to last year's numbers. Um, what we would like to say is that the wine industry contributes directly and indirectly into the tourism industry to a substantial amount. There is substantial investment going on at the moment from some of our members um, creating new propositions and improving the propositions that they've had. And one of the things that's driving that is the investment that you've made over the last three years because the numbers of uh, visitors we're seeing, particularly in shoulder and winter, um, thanks to the um, increased spending that Hawke's Bay Tourism's had, is seeing us um, enjoying uh, far more visitors across the year. And as a result of that, um, our businesses, a lot of our members are investing, and they're investing to grow their tourism um, experience, and they're investing to be open when they weren't before. So a lot of our wineries are opening right through the year now where they wouldn't have previously because we've actually got people in the district coming to the region and they want to experience the region when they're here. Um, that's where I think um, we're, very, we're very mindful that um, one of the other arguments that's been put forward is that it's up to the industry to invest. Um, we would say, yes, that's true, and we do. Um, it's up to the industry and actually everyone who runs a business in Hawke's Bay to invest for creating the experience that people have when they visit. Um, the job of actually bringing people here and getting people to put Hawke's Bay in their consideration set when they're deciding where they're going to visit when they visit New Zealand um, is, we think, something that is of value to the whole region, not just to the tourism industry, but to everywhere that people shop, where they eat, where they buy their pharmaceuticals, where they get their transport from, and so forth. So we, we and, and from our perspective, we're very, very mindful that actually the only organisation that is capable of actually um, collecting that investment from the, the region, across the region, and making it on behalf of the region, is Hawke's Bay Regional Council. So we believe that that's a really important um, reason for regional council to maintain the funding that you have been putting in. Um, I think that's in the interest of time and your attention spans and giving you a break. <laughs> I think that's probably covered off the main points that we made in our submissions and I know your submission and I know you'll have read that. Thank you, Liz. Thanks. Um, attention span is an issue. Of council. course, yeah. exactly. Um, <laughs> but I'm sure someone will have questions. Uh, Neil first, and then Fent. Yeah, thank, thank you for your submission. Uh, can, can you, you've referenced contributions mm. made by wine growers mm. uh, to um, uh, Hawke's Bay Tourism. Can mm. you tell us how many dollars this, the wine sector contributes to uh, 
Hawke's Bay Tourism, and I understand you've got 100, did you say 100 um, wineries and... We've got 79 wineries. Yes. Um, 100 vineyards. 100 vineyards. Yeah, so yeah. So they're not vineyards. necessarily the same thing. So maybe, you can have a winery and a vineyard, sure, sure. but you might not have a winery if you have a vineyard. <laughs> you tell us how much money... Yeah, sure. So um, I can't give you an exact figure, um, and the reason for that is that some of it is actually not recorded, but we believe that about 150000 comes from the industry into what's called Contra, and supporting um, um, Hawke's Bay Tourism, for sure. example, with visitors. We also... Um, a lot of our members <coughs> are members of Hawke's Bay Tourism, so, they've, so they actually pay through their memberships. And then there's also the investment we make, um, the, the industry makes in things like events. Sure, no, um, I appreciate all that, but in terms of dollar the actual value? dollar no, given I can't. handed over to Hawke's Bay, you don't know that. To Hawke's Bay Tourism? Yes. No, but they should know. <laughs> because, <laughs> because it's in a, th they will know. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Fenton? Very the brief, no. brief question. Um, thank you, Liz. The, the reason, my humble opinion, the reason the Regional Council is rating for tourism is there's no mechanism to uh, bring the money in. Uh, you know, every other industry's got a, a, a compulsory levy of some sort, yes. which is then used for marketing. Yes. Can you um, put a, a brief bit of thought into who would be levied if, if that was the way to go in the future and it, and it was no longer a burden on the ratepayer? How could you, who, who, would you, who would you include in a levy <laughs> system? Well, therein lies the problem. Um, and I would suggest that that's a hiding to nothing to try and work out who should be levied. And that's the reason why this is a, an incredibly important role for the regional council to take, because under any other scenario, there will people be people who, who benefit from the um, economic and social and environmental um, upside of having a, tur a, a burgeoning and, and flourishing tourism industry, um, and they won't, won't necessarily contribute. So the most equitable way to do it is for regional council to levy it. So it's important, but not um, We do, we've run out of time, and a little fence to other people, but Tom, oh, you, oh, let, it, let it go. <coughs> um, if we were to uh, proceed with a $300,000 cut in the tourism budget next year, mm -hmm. uh, would that be a cut that would be sufficient given your comment on page 483 in your proposal that the wine industry would have less reason to continue to invest in ensuring continued growth? So it's a one-off cut that you're making, not a series of cuts no, you're suggesting? No, I'm, I'm just talking about next year. I mean, the, your, the statement here is that uh, the sky will fall. No, it's uh, if not. We, if we cut Hawke's Bay Tourism's funding, and I'm just trying to get a sense I, I don't of quantum believe I as to yeah. at what point will that actually happen. I don't believe that we said the sky would fall. I said, I think we, we, what we did say was that it's a, it's a co-investment arrangement where we believe that the industry um, is able and capable of invest, able to and capable of investing um, because of a growth in tourists, in tourism, vis in, in visitors and tourism spend in the district. So if that is affected by a change or a reduction in the regional council's investment on behalf of the region in tourism, then the likelihood is that over time, the industry won't see the opportunity or the reason to invest. And, and one simple way in that, one simple example of that is we will not stay open. A lot of venues won't stay open over the winter if we don't have the people coming in in the winter that we've, that we've attracted over the last couple of years. So the 10-year strategy that you referenced at the mm -hmm. outset here is predicated on uh, uh, continued the the high-level funding of Hawke's Bay Tourism? The 10-year strategy that we've got will be um, will have a, a significant focus on wine tourism for Hawke's Bay. If the regional tourism investment drops over time, we will probably, um, I can't say for sure, but we would probably look to reduce our investment in wine tourism and put that into international exports instead, because that's the other half of the strategy. Thank you, um, Liz. Um, Thank you. So we let you go over a little bit over time because no, the, our next person hasn't turned up. But, cool. Thank you, I appreciate um, that. But you did really well, and you, you. you have a fantastic industry that yes, contributes. Yes, we do. You do. It's, a, it's really got a lot of magic to it. It absolutely has. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thanks very much. We've got a 10-minute break, guys.